I'm the Director of Policy Initiatives at the Center for Child and Family Policy, and we're thrilled to see all of you here. I don't think there is an empty seat, uh, which is great. And we are thrilled to have this distinguished panel of guests in front of us. I will introduce the moderator in just a moment, but first I'd just like to ask Phil Costanzo uh, to come up for a minute. Well, I'm here uh, actually to represent all of us, all of us in the center and all of us in the university. Uh, because while we're celebrating the 10th year of this remarkable center, uh, we really need to express our appreciation and we desire to express our appreciation strongly to the prime mover of this uh, center, the person who built it and whose very lifeblood makes it work, and that's Ken Dodge. And, uh, yeah. Woo now, I can, I'm not going to take a lot of time. There are much more interesting things to, for us to get to, but no, no more important thing. Uh, that I think that uh, uh, I remember, uh, I think it was about 12 years ago, sitting in a room with Sonny Ladd and Phil Cook and John Cooey, discussing who can take us forward at, as a university in the domain of children and families, for which we had wonderful developmental scientists here and there throughout the university and individuals interested in the venues in which children and families grow and the science that goes along with, with making those venues better. Uh, and uh, with, with Dean Bill Chafe, we, we vetted a number of people, but when it came to it, um, I remembered Ken when he was a very, very young man. In fact, I was a very, very young man when I remember Ken. And, uh, and he was a graduate student here at Duke. And one of the things that Ken had was a combination of of attributes that said that he would be the person. He was very ambitious. He was a, a brilliant scientist, and we all saw that when he was a graduate student. And he also had true concern for the lives of people and children, and he was able to put those things together and create a vision. Uh, that's not always smooth going. Uh, uh, but because it's not always smooth going, we don't recognize how important and how much admiration we need to have and do have for Ken. And I speak now for research scientists, for our students, for the, the wonderful staff we have, and, and for our community here at Duke and our co larger community in Durham. Uh, Ken has taken us to the world, and he's taken us to our very nearby community. And what he has done is what we all aspire to do in, in, at this particular point in time to take the best we know to the most important individuals that can use that best, that is, children and the co context in which they live. Ken has done that. Ken is one of the few people in, in this country and in the world who does it well. Uh, and uh, he does it by employing the talent around him and by using his own talents and own passion to make things better. I would, I would implore each of you to recognize the achievements of Ken as a wonderful director of a center, as a wonderful scientist, and as a person who keeps moving through the advancement of our society as a humane and uh, uh, a uh, uh, knowledgeable uh, place both. Uh, and uh, so for Ken, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate it. And I'm sure I'm not speaking for myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. And you know that was intentionally not on the agenda. But we'll get back to the agenda now. You're all here because you know that the theme for this forum is prioritizing investments in young children. And in particular, it's in prioritizing investments for young children in a time of very, very scarce resources. Um, it's hard to imagine that this is possible, but each of our speakers here, whom we'll be introduced in just a minute, will speak for about eight minutes. Um, hard to imagine given their incredible years of dedication and expertise to this issue. Um, they will highlight the priorities and principles for difficult decision making and offer their recommendations, importantly, offer their recommendations for addressing this challenge. Um, in the spirit of encouraging participation, they do not have PowerPoints. Uh, we will hold, if possible, hold your questions till the end. Um, and now it's my honor to introduce our forum moderator, Marguerite Kondraki. Marguerite Kondraki has been president and CEO of America's Promise Alliance since 2004. 
And as most of you probably know, America's Promise was founded over 10 years ago by General Colin Powell to make children and youth a national priority. America's Promise is currently focused on addressing the nation's high school dropout crisis, which I think is touching all of us, whether we have kids or work kids or no kids in one way or another, um, no matter what our role is. During her 40-year career, she's been both an entrepreneur and a public servant. Before joining the Alliance, she served as special assistant to U.S. Senator Lamar Alexander and staff director for the Senate Subcommittee on Children and Families. Can't imagine anything much more relevant than that um, for today's discussion. Um, she co-founded and was CEO of Right Horizons Family Solutions, the nation's largest employer-sponsored childcare company. Now, she told me not to read all this, so I'm almost done. She did want me to say that she's very happy about the current situation in the NCAA men's <laughs> basketball standings, which was not something I was given, but I will add that at your request. Um, and for the past two years, she has been named one of the top 50 people of power and influence by the nonprofit Times. We are honored to have you here today. Um, I should say she's partly excited about the basketball standings because she is an alum of Duke, um, so we're honored and pleased to have you here today, and we look forward to a lively discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Jenny. It's wonderful to be with you, and I would like to just say a few things to get us started, and then I will introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, I am also very privileged to be a Duke trustee right now. And I wanted to especially recognize uh, the First Lady of Duke, Cindy Broadhead. So thank you, Cindy. <laughs> I've been privileged to get to know her as I have gotten to know Dick. And she leads with grace and passion on behalf of children and families and uh, the connections that Durham has with Duke. And I think that the university community is privileged to have you in service with your husband. So thank you. I would also like to recognize, and they can actually help if there are follow-up thoughts and questions about America's Promise, Carmita Vaughn and Forrest Moore, if you'll raise your hands. They are here with me, so thanks for coming. They're both from Chicago, so they know all the secrets of Arnie Duncan and then some. <laughs> So this is the 10th anniversary of the center, and I join our, all of us in effusive praise, if you can, for your vision and, and your execution against that vision. Um, I am pleased that the Duke basketball team was able to execute <laughs> against their vision last night, and may the Duke women likewise also play in Baylor tonight. What a small world that is. So uh, cheers to, to the basketball fortunes of Duke. Quite exciting. Um, I do want to take just a minute to set the context for our conversation. I have spent uh, all of my adult life focused on children and families in either the private or the public sector and now the nonprofit sector. And I think it's fair to say that when resources were more plentiful certainly than they are today, still outcomes for children were not what we would wish them to be. And now when resources are constrained, what are we to do? And so that is the pivotal question that we will begin to engage with our distinguished panelists. I do think that, interestingly enough, uh, a crisis does sharpen the focus. And I do think that the high school dropout crisis has captured um, the interest and has been an urgent wake-up call for the nation when we think about our children and their future, and therefore our future. When we talk about our children being our future, it's, it's truly a cliche for this group, and yet we, we need to remind ourselves, and the nation and the larger community, we need to remind ourselves that this is more true than ever before. So I think we have a unique opportunity to help the nation as well as the policymakers appreciate the importance of investing in children. I do think the nation more or less is ready for education reform. I do think the nation truly gets it when they realize that this nation has uh, a threatened future at best when half the young people of color are dropping out of high school and a third of all students are dropping out. So it is against that backdrop that I think we can actually engage a larger discussion. Um, it has never been more true that our children are our future, and it is certainly true today because we do live in such uncertain times. So we have over a million children dropping out of high school, but you can't start in the 11th grade, 
You can't even start with a great teacher for high school and ensure that we can change that dynamic. So we must appreciate that we have to start well before high school. And in fact, there was a letter to the editor in the USA Today. And you know, when you start seeing, this is a mega trend theory, when you start seeing local press, and USA Today is everybody's local newspaper, so when you start seeing local press speak about your issues, you know you're getting traction. And so this letter to the editor says, in education, everything matters. The point is that <coughs> strengthening communities, improving the lives of children, cannot be accomplished by attacking piecemeal strategies. There are health issues, yes. There are great teachers needed, yes. Better curriculum, yes. So what counts in efforts to fix American schools? Simply everything. And the sooner we start thinking about more systemic fixes, the better off our children are going to be. And yet, between 1960 and 2006, so for 40 years, the share of domestic spending by the federal government that went to children fell from 20% to 15%. Between 2004-2008, there was a $231 billion increase in federal spending not related to defense, and only 1% of that went to children. And what is the impact of this economic crisis? Well, there's a dramatic increase in poverty, there's a dramatic increase in child hunger, there's a dramatic increase in child homelessness, and I've already spoken about the high school dropout crisis. So we have clearly a lack of readiness for college in the workforce. We also have increases in infant mortality and recent rises in teen pregnancy after years of gradual decline. So we do not have enough young people with the nourishing building blocks that they need for their own success and for our nation's future. And in fact, uh, my ultimate boss, my uber boss, General Colin Powell, he was startled to see a Pentagon study that said that of the young people who approach the recruitment center thinking, okay, I can certainly get a job here, only three of every 10 is eligible for the military because of education issues, health issues, mental health issues, you name it. But the holistic support for these young people have been missing for all of their young lives. Now in the past year we've seen a renewed interest in children and in spite of a freeze on discretionary spending, President Obama's budget does include an increase for children. 7% increase, so we're beginning to make up quite a lot of lost momentum. Last month, he also announced that he wanted to fully fund the Children's Health Insurance Plan through 2016. And of course, he has continued President Bush's commitment to education and has backed it up with massive federal investments with the Race to the Top Fund and his 2011 budget request. Yet, we have federal monies coming in, but the bottom is, uh, the drain is, uh, it has been, the, the plug has been lifted from the drain in the bathtub and all the state monies and the county monies and the city monies are going the other way. The recession is deep and it's still with us and we have children feeling that hit especially. So Arizona is scrapping its preschool program and its child health program. New Jersey has cut 820 million in aid to the public schools. California has made deep cuts and has canceled summer programming and after school programming. So all of these cuts in the human services, in healthcare and education and juvenile justice, and after school programs, this points to a very grim future. So the children are clearly taking the brunt of the fiscal crisis and we do, I think, can, can use this dropout crisis as a rallying cry to help the average man on the street appreciate that we must focus on our children or our nation is truly <coughs> at risk. So, with so many needs and so many issues before us, how do we pr prioritize the investments we make in our children? How do we attract those investments and get people to understand the importance of those investments in a time of budget shortfall? How do we inspire a sustained commitment to children? Um, in some ways, I believe this is a communications challenge as much as it, as it is a policy and fiscal challenge. So we do have, fortunately, three people who are going to explain all this to us and give <laughs> us all the answers and give us the roadmap forward. And if they don't figure it all out, we'll have Dr. Heckman this afternoon. <laughs> so, 
Let me in, uh, make quick introductions of our three panelists, and then I will invite all three of them to give opening comments, and then we'll engage in a spirited discussion, because every other person in this room could have been on the panel, and so we're counting on a good deal of spirited discussion. Larry Aber is Professor of Applied Psychology and Public Policy at the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development at NYU. He also chairs the board of NYU's Institute for Human Development and Social Change. He is an internationally recognized expert in child development and social policy. We wouldn't have had any other kind of person here for you today. <laughs> His basic research examines the influence of poverty and violence at the family and community level and he focuses on holistic child development. He's frequently asked to testify before Congress and state legislatures, and the mayor of New York invited him to be on his Commission for Economic Opportunity to help reduce poverty and to increase the economic <coughs> opportunity for all people in New York City. He's also been a distinguished visiting professor right here at Duke and also at Chapel Hill. We won't talk about that. <laughs> Oh, yes, we did. <laughs> I forgot about Ron. I forgot about Ron. <laughs> Ron is a, is a friend from Washington and senior fellow of economic studies at the Brookings Institution in D.C. He co-directs the Brookings Center on Children and Families, and he is nationally recognized for his expertise on the social welfare issues. He's been an advisor to White House and Congress on welfare issues and was instrumental in the 1996 overhaul of the national welfare policy. Before joining Brookings, he spent 14 years on the staff of the House Ways and Means Human Resources Subcommittee, and he has served as a senior researcher at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Center at Chapel Hill, has taught and lectured at, uh, at Chapel Hill Charlotte, and I mean UNC Charlotte, and also taught developmental psychology here at Duke. His recent book with Bell Sawhill, Creating an Opportunity Society, examines economic opportunity in the U.S. and explores how to create more of that, especially for those who might feel stuck on the bottom rung of the economic ladder. And finally, perhaps our most distinguished panelist, Governor Jim Hunt. Former Governor Hunt served four historic terms here in North Carolina, and he made his time count for children and families. He focused on early childhood development and improved the quality of teaching, led the way among governors to pick up the banner of better education and better investments in our children. He founded the Smart Start program, which is still internationally recognized as a model for comprehensive early childhood education <coughs> and holistic supports for children and families. He's been recognized countless times and in countless ways for his innovative public service and leadership. He's currently uh, a member of the law firm of Womble, Carlisle, Sandridge, and Rice, but we won't hold that lawyering against you, Governor Hunt. <laughs> He's also chairman of the board of directors of two institutes that he founded, the Hunt Institute for Educational Leadership and Policy in Chapel Hill and the Institute for Emerging Issues at NC State in Raleigh. So uh, it is a great privilege to have these three panelists, and I know everyone appreciates how lucky we all are, or the room would not be full for standing only. So thank you, and I will invite uh, Larry to go first. Thank you, Marjorie. Uh, um, happy anniversary to uh, the center. What, what an honor to be here. And um, uh, I, I want to sit down soon uh, so we can engage in the discussion. So uh, my comments today uh, really pick up where Marguerite's uh, left off, and that has to do with where we are in real time right now. 
uh, and, and their children. And uh, um, I want to begin uh, thinking about our nation's response by thinking about uh, the stimulus package. And most of you know that there were a highly contested stimulus package uh, that sent $787 billion into the economy um, was, was uh, uh, the, all the rage and, and much discussion in the last year or two. And uh, it begins to show that um, there is a possibility of doing something different. Uh, as uh, many research organizations, First Focus among them, have documented, um, the federal government spends about 10% of its total budget directly on children uh, and about 15% of its non-military federal budget directly on children. The Stimulus Act spent just about 20% on it. So uh, compared to baseline budgets, uh, we have invested proportionately more in families with children in the stimulus package. And the, the stimulus package uh, 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 spends money on children in four big ways. About 80 billion of it uh, on education, about 30 billion of it on tax credits, uh, and the high 20s on health, and the balance, uh, which is less than that, uh, under 10 billion, on everything else, uh, from welfare reform to juvenile justice, et cetera, et cetera. So these are marginal increases in uh, the, f the federal expenditures towards kids and families. And uh, it's an enormously important uh, start, in my opinion. Uh, for those of you who keep track of these things, that money runs out at the end of this year, okay? We are about to hit a big public investment cliff that uh, children and families uh, are going to affect children and families' investments but are also going to affect uh, the first line responders, localities and states. In, uh, and um, Marguerite indicated that states are in terrible turmoil. Uh, the projections are that states, uh, the 50 states will run combined deficits, uh, uh, be in the hole, they can't by constitution run deficits, they'll be in the hole in the 150 to 180 billion dollar range for the next couple of years. So um, we are facing another national economic crisis in both families' ability to invest in their children and the public sector's uh, ability and willingness to invest in their children. So this recession is enormous and, uh, um, and, and we will live with its results for a long time and we have actions and choices that we can take now. Uh, the deficit made an explicit decision. It decided to invest more this 20% of its expenditures in children and families, uh, increasing, explicitly deciding to increase temporarily our national uh, uh, deficit, uh, our, our spending more than we're taking in. And there are really only three ways. I'm, I'm not a Nobel laureate economist, but I know enough economics to know that uh, if you want to spend more on kids, you either have to deficit spend more, raise revenues, or take money out of the budget from other th things that uh, are you, you, you want to redeploy resources. And those are the three political realities. We either can continue, the, the, the fourth option is not to spend more now on kids and families. So I'm not in favor of spending more on ki in kids and families. I think that's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. It's penny wise and pound foolish. We can talk about that more. I'm in favor of spending more. But we'll have a trade off to make uh, about whether we want to do that through continued deficit spending. We want to do it by taking money away from other uh, initiatives, or we want to do it by increasing revenues. And that is, uh, in my opinion, the big macro picture, the political economic macro picture in which the question of investments in children uh, uh, is to be debated over the next couple of years. So um, I've been doing about five minutes. Do I have three minutes left? No, three minutes, okay. So. Yeah, uh, I've never been accused of being able to keep time real well, but apparently I'm not too far off. So, um, so those are the, the big macro issues. Uh, I, I'd be happy to engage much more specifically. I, I think there's a lot of good ideas about how to spend money uh, more effectively, and, and uh, I agree with uh, some of Ron Haskins and Bell Sawhill's analysis in their book that on the longer term, we are going to have to... Uh, uh, this from a guy who's about to turn 60, uh, take money uh, uh, relatively from 
older generations, and that's the worst way of putting it. Delay p spending money on them uh, a little later is the better way of putting it. But there's got to be some kind of generational fix, OK? And if there isn't some kind of generational fix, I don't see a smooth landing on getting federal spending uh, aligned against our goals. Um, we are an increasingly aging society. The aging society requires more funds. I'm not in favor of uh, clawing back Social Security in any major way. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about the kinds of things that Ron and Bell have raised, which is maybe delaying uh, the, the retirement age, uh, maybe shifting uh, Social Security payments. Uh, there's got to be something where the people relatively better off in our nation uh, are able to help people relatively worse off. I'll, I'll end on one final note, which is that from my point of view, both families and the public sector need to focus on those two stages in the children's life cycle when families, especially low-income families, are least able to invest in their children. Uh, between 60 and 80 percent of all public expenditures are spent on public education, K to 12. That means that before children uh, go to school and after children leave public school, uh, children are most dependent on their families to support them. And low-income children are especially least able and least prepared to do that. Uh, and so my final advice is that we begin to articulate and use a principle in making the very sh difficult short-term political and economic trade-offs in investing in children. And that's that we think about achieving a society that has developmental equity in our investments. I believe that we should be investing about the same amount of resources before children go to public school and after children leave public school but before they're self-sustaining adults. We spend, you know what the people expenditures are in public uh, um, education. Well, we know that developmentally, there's nothing magical about K to 12. Zero to five is important. And with all due respect to Professor Heckman, who never said it's only important to invest early, but uh, he's often understood as saying that. Um, there's plenty of investments to make uh, after children leave uh, public education before they're adults. And uh, if we set a roadmap for that kind of investment, and we make the short-term uh, investment decisions traded off against that, I think we can use this crisis as an opportunity to begin to, to readjust our, our vision and our resources in a way that is adequate to, to investing smartly in our kids and our families. Thanks very much. When, when Ken invited me to come to this event, he did not say it was after the regional finals. I had told him on several occasions how bad UNC was going to be this year, and he kept telling me, no, they're not going to be that bad. 32 points to Duke, that's bad. But I decided that I was going to use all the self-control I had and not bring this up today. But when I got in the car this morning, the professor, Joel Rausch, who picked me up, said, Perhaps you noticed that the sky is not Carolina blue. <laughs> so I figure anything I say is well justified. <laughs> now I also realized when Ken invited me that I was going to be on a panel with Governor Hunt, uh, who is my, one of my all-time heroes. Uh, I, I'd love to tell you some stories from the back room about things that he agreed to do, but I'm not sure he would be my friend anymore if I did. Um, but they involve something I'm going to talk about later. That's a, that's a hint. Um, in fact, I was so excited, I called my mom. And I said, who's 91 years old. I said, Mom, guess what? I'm going to be on a panel with Governor Hunt. And she said, oh, isn't that nice, sweetheart? She always says, isn't that nice, sweetheart? And then she said, who is Governor Hunt? <laughs> so uh, now do I have, what, nine minutes left? OK, so look, here's what I propose. Uh, we dance around this problem as a country, we've done it forever. We need to spend more money and 
make sure we follow the results with minorities in this country. We have a bad history. We've tried, we've done a lot, I think, to make up for it. But it's getting worse in many ways because of our immigration policies, uh, especially immigrants from Mexico. And if anybody looks at the data, they are just astounding. Let me give you three examples. Mean income, white families, 57,000. Black families, 35,000. Hispanic, Hispanic families, 35,000. 60% of the white average is what Hispanics and blacks have. Kids living with both parents. And I will tell you, and let's have an argument about this, if anybody doubts it, that one of the most important resources kids have when they grow up is two married parents who are committed body and soul to them. White kids, at any given moment, 74% are in married couple families. For black kids, 35%. Uh, and for Hispanic kids, 65 and Hispanics are working hard to catch up. By the second and third generation, are almost as bad as the rest of us. Must be something in the water. And here is an astounding statistic from my colleagues, uh, Bell Sawhill and, uh, and Julia Isaacs. For white middle class families, averaging 56,000 income, and this is back in the 1980s, their kids, when fully grown, based on five year average income, they make 32% more than their children. This is from the middle 20% of distribution. For black kids, they earn 7% less than their parents. Black parents cannot even pass on their well-being to their own children, despite their best attempts to do so. So these three indicators show that we have to do something. And let me be very optimistic about one point. I'd like to thank Richard Albert for actually knowing him uh, from NYU for this uh, observation. To some extent, we have a zero-sum game. There are a limited number of $100,000 a year jobs and so forth. We are coming to a time between now and 2030, say, when we will have tens of millions of people in extremely lucrative positions, responsible positions in our universities and business and politics, who will be retiring because they're baby boomers. And this is going to open up a vast amount of opportunity uh, for young minority kids. They're still half going to still have competition for all these positions, of course, that's the American way. But this is a huge new opportunity. And I see a huge irony here that Larry will appreciate, I think. In 1965, Daniel pa Patrick Moynihan uh, wrote a report about black families, and he pointed out that with the Civil Rights Revolution, there's going to be a huge new opportunity for black, black families, but they probably cannot take advantage of it because the family is too weak and it has impacts on their kids' development. He was absolutely attacked unmercifully uh, two years ago, there was a wonderful meeting at Harvard of top scholars from the country who affirmed that one hand was exactly right. We have a huge problem with families, and that if, especially for our minorities, and we have to do something about it. So we're in that same situation again. Here is a great opportunity. We're not going to have an opportunity like this, so we really need to focus on it. So what should we do? Uh, in our book that uh, you so kindly mentioned, I appreciate that, Marguerite, um, uh, we pro propose three profound solutions. Nobody else would ever thought of this. We need stronger families, we need more work, and we need more education. How about those? Right? I can't talk about all of them here. How much time do I have? Oh, wow. I can talk about all three of them after all. Um, I want to talk just about education. Uh, I think education is definitely, I mean, we have the strongest data that education is the way to the top. It always has been in the American way. There's a recent book by Goldman Katz uh, that lays out the history of this in beautiful de detail. And America has led the world for 150 years, primarily because our schools have led the world. First, we were one of the first countries to have universal free education. And then we had magnificent universities. We still have by far the best universities in the world, but we're losing ground in all these ways. And so we are really threatened uh, in our world position uh, and we may not be able to maintain our leadership if we continue in the way that we're going now. Uh, in our book, we talk at great length about preschool, about K-12, and about uh, post-secondary. And we have recommendations in all of these areas. But I want to focus just on preschool and post-secondary. I bet Governor Hunt is going to talk quite a bit about public schools. I know from what I've heard him talk, that's what he does. So first, we have very strong evidence that high-quality preschool programs really do make a difference. And it radiates all the way into adulthood. Uh, Francis Campbell's here from Frank Porter Graham, the Abbasidarian program, I think is probably the strongest evidence. Uh, Perry Preschool is pretty interesting evidence. And the Chicago uh, public school program uh, that was operated with a large number of kids under, uh, under real world conditions uh, also had these long term impacts. 
And I mean, in the abecedarian program, even rates of college attendance were boosted quite substantially. So preschool could really make a difference. Now, we recently have had a report on Head Start. We spend $7 billion a year on Head Start. This is partly a response to Larry's point about money. We have 900,000 kids in Head Start, and I've been arguing for years it doesn't do the job. I didn't necessarily make myself popular, uh, but the new study from Westat shows at the end of first, uh, the first year in school, Head Start kids are indistinguishable from random, randomly assigned controls. That, there is no way around. We need to redeploy that money. And one thing that we should do, by contrast with Head Start, state preschool programs, 40 states now have preschool programs, maybe it's soon to be 39, uh, if there is one of those the way that Larry uh, indicated. Um, and maybe some other states are gonna be hurt as well, because they really are in desperate shape. Uh, so we need to give, and state preschool programs have random assignment evaluations and other types of evaluations, so they're doing quite a good job, much better than Head Start. So I think we need to give more control to the states of Head Start. I'd start right here in North Carolina because the preschool programs here have been good ever since Governor Hunt uh, launched them on a, on a widespread basis. And I'll bet if you got him a room, got him alone at night and he had a scotch or so, he might say, you got to do him Head Start. We never could court. So in some states, Head Start has been cooperative, but in many states it has not been. A key is to give more control to the states of the money that we're already spending, this addresses the problem that Larry brought up. Uh, so we have to first make efficient use of our resources. Now let me say a few words uh, about uh, post-secondary uh, education. This is really, if you look at the numbers that I uh, passed out on one side, it shows all those lines. What those lines show you, I think most people know, and that is that education directly, is directly correlated with income. But what, if you look at it carefully, you will also notice that essentially only people with a college, four-year college degree and professional and graduate degrees have increased their income in the last three decades. It's astounding. High school dropouts, their income has actually declined, so not only do we have these big differences, but they're moving in the wrong direction for everybody except people who have a four-year degree or above. And again, the Golden Cats book explains why that's the case. There's a good reason. It's because of changes in our economy. So we simply, and then if you turn that over, that's a very complicated figure, but I just want to make one point for you. On the left are kids who did not go to college. On the right are kids who did go to college. And the sections of the bar graphs are the parents' income. So the bottom, second, and all the way up to the top. Now if you look in the left, uh, on the one on the left, on, on the left-hand side, and look at the bottom, that tells you that 42% of kids from parents who are low income stay in the bottom of uh, 20%. 40 to you, if it were a chance, it would be 20%. So it's more than twice as much. Um, if you look at the top, you'll see that only 5% of kids from the bottom make it to the top. Now look at the same, uh, the same segments on the right hand side. Think of this. A kid from a low income family from the bottom 20% of families who gets a four year college degree increases their chance of making it to the top by a factor of four. Now, I know there are a lot of researchers in this room. Tell me about any intervention that where the exper experimental group is four times as high as the control group. It just doesn't happen. We simply have to get more kids into college. We lay out a number of complicated steps in our, in our book, and let me just mention a few of them. Here's one idea I love. I'm going to give two ideas, right? The first one is the IRS should send a letter based on their income tax credit. They know who low-income low families are when kids are young and say to their parents, guess what? You might not think your kid can go to college, but we are going to, because of the public financing available in the United States, your child is el would be eligible for approximately, and give the number, it'll shock them. And it would happen early, I think it would completely change their attitude about their uh, uh, child going to college. We've, the administration has already done a magnificent job on the Pell Grant, we're expanding it. We haven't expanded enough, it still has not kept up with the college costs which are way above inflation, so we need to expand the Pell Grant even more. And finally, the area where I think we're the weakest is we need to do a lot more uh, once kids get to college. Low-income kids get to college, the dropouts rate are completely astounding. Uh, and both blacks and Hispanics have lower entry rates, and even lower, higher dropout rates, so lower graduation rates, so it's a huge problem. And let me end, uh, fortunately, uh, Larry knew I was gonna be out of time, and so he brought up how I wanted to end, which is we need intergenerational transfer. The last chapter in our book explains in great detail, we do not have to cut spending on the elderly. Indeed, it will increase substantially. But we just need to slow the rate of increase in spending on the elderly. There are lots of ways we could do it that would not damage Social Security. 
and would not damage Medicare, and we need to invest that money in the kids. Invest in the kids, mostly in the minorities. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be here with all of you. I want to congratulate uh, the Center for Children and Family Policy on their 10th anniversary, Ken. And I'm delighted to be here at the Sanford School, <laughs> named for my hero and my mentor, Terry Sanford. And <laughs> delighted that Ms. Broadhead is here. Uh, I served with her husband on the Carnegie Corporation Board in New York and learned a lot from him. But I'm also pleased to be here with all of you because you care about all of this. By the way, Jenny Owens was the head of my policy office when I was gone. You can believe we focused on all of this stuff. And I'm pleased to be here with, uh, with, with so many people. Judges I appointed, uh, smart start directors, I can go on and on. You're all over the place. By the way, uh, some of you have been here all day, so you know how the day started this morning. I just came in, the sun's come out, and the sky is Carolina. <laughs> but we're all for Duke at my house, where both parents and all four children have a Carolina degree. Uh, we love the men. Sunder's got to get going if we're going to win it. But you know who we love? The women. The Duke women. You ever seen anybody as fast as that Thomas gal? They are terrific. By the way, my wife went a year to Northern Iowa before she transferred to Carolina. That was the best game, wasn't it? Of the whole tournament. But I am I'm really pleased to be here because you are talking about something that I care a lot about. And I hope all of you are going to hear Dr. Heckman this afternoon. Um, in 1992, and, and to some degree before that, um, we were really all focused on early childhood. I remember, you know, I got onto it here in North Carolina, and I you know, learned a lot before then, but particularly then. That's when we started Smart Start. Uh, the person who succeeded me as governor added four at four. That's great. Uh, I remember the governors getting excited about it. Governors' conferences in Vermont and uh, out in St. Louis, Missouri, where my fellow governors uh, were a little behind me, but coming along. Uh, we're beginning to get all of this. George Bonovich, uh, fine then governor and then United States Senator from Ohio, and Lamar Alexander was a great leader as he was on every, everything, Marguerite. Um, we focused here with Smart Start on birth to five. Birth to five. Maybe pre-birth to five. That is absolutely the way to do it, what we have to do if we're going to be successful. I would say with the children in Smart Start, we are about half funded. We got up to about $300 million a year that the state was putting in, one of the largest amounts in the country. Uh, it ought to be about double that. Uh, we set up, for those of you who don't know about Smart Start, we set up uh, a nonprofit 501c3 corporations in most every county. Some of the count small counties went together. I, I sometimes call that partnership board or the Smart Start board, the, the, the school board for little children <laughs> because all the people are on that on that board. They're all sitting there at the table figuring out how we can help our little children. Now, you got a lot of smart people here, great researchers, all of you students here at the Sanford School. The person you really ought to talk to today is the director of Smart Start from my home county, Wilson County. Jim Hawley, stand up. You all want to talk to him, stand up. He's, he's, his wife Nancy is there with him just as good as he is. 
but he's down where the rubber meets the road, folks, where you're having to try to figure out how to do all this. And the great leader here in Durham has been celebrating today uh, what a great job they do. So we've had, a, we've had some parks. When I was governor for my last eight years, I wore out the legislature talking about Smart Start. I mean, I had people come up and say, I am sick and tired of hearing you talk about Smart Start and all those little children, their little minds. You know what? I kept doing it. And I still give them a slug out every once in a while because they aren't getting enough. But let me, let me give you some suggestions about where we are and what I think we're going to have to do if we're going to really be successful. And this comes sort of from a political perspective and an economic perspective. Uh, first of all, I think that further real and terrific progress is going to require that we tie, we tie more persuasively early child efforts to K-12 education. You know, I love the little children. And I want them to be treated right. They're God's children as well as our children. But if you want to get the, the public leaders to put the kind of money in and give the kind of emphasis that I think we ought to do in the earliest years, they've got to see that it's going to contribute to children in the public schools or in all the schools. Learning, being at grade level or above, graduating, being college ready, and being very good competitive workers in the global economy. Now, some of you are sort of looking at me like, well, what is that, what is that important? It's important because a lot of us who think in this area and work in this area have talked about child care, and it is care. But we've got to be talking about education. Education, early childhood education that's going to contribute to and be essential to children be, being successful in K-12 and going on to the <coughs> community colleges and colleges beyond. That's essential, folks, if we're going to go further now. We've gone as far as we can go without making that connection and using the right terms and explaining to legislators and the private sector that this we've got to have this in order to get that, in order for President Obama and Arnie Duncan's programs to be successful. And I think they're on the right track, but if you don't have this, they, they will not succeed. Uh, second, let me uh, say that I think it's, it is essential that we show more clearly the beneficial effects on K-12, high, high school graduation and so on, of quality early childhood education. We, we have sort of assumed those things. We've got some studies, uh, the charts and the graphs and all that. What I'm saying is we've got to show that these children who started off in these early childhood programs develop more cognitively. I think we ought to be measuring how they're doing. Now, when I've dealt with early childhood people, they've told me, oh, no, we can't be testing them. And they have fought it. Well, let's just measure how their, their minds are developing. And, and what's going to cause their minds to develop more in those earliest years? Well, there are a lot of experts in here who know a lot about that. I think a lot of it has to do with vocabulary. I think they need to be read to a lot more. They need to learn words. They need to just be, you know, doused in words. Somebody coming in here today was telling me about their child program. I mean, they're working with the families. You've got to do so much more of that. And those kids have really got to learn more so that when they start the school, they are ready to go. And we've got to measure whether or not they're making a lot of progress so we can prove that this early childhood work in these funds are paying off. 
they're not going to accept it. We can't just, you know, give them a generalization. Oh, fine, that sounds good. We give you more money. No, we got to prove that it's working, and they have got to be ready. And then I think uh, we have to think a lot more about the funding. Uh, this is basically a state initiative. Most of the funding, except the Head Start, and I agree with everything that uh, was just said. I think Head Start, I love Head Start. I've been to many of the programs. I love the people who work in there. But it is not of the quality it needs to be. And we ought to put it under the state efforts. If the, if the Smart Start people had some control over the use of Head Start funds and working together, but working with real strong direction and high standards and, and, a, and a requirement that we meet them, I think we'd be doing a lot better. So we've got to have state initiatives uh, or initiative to get more funding and better quality. We've got to sell it to local government. I don't know how many of you know anything about your local governments. I know you've got some local government people here today. Of the 100 counties in North Carolina, I wonder how many we're a county system or, or cities either. I wonder how many of them have in their budget, Sunny Land, an item of funding that's going to early childhood. Anybody got an idea about that? I think it's zero, by the way. And I would like to be corrected. A little more than zero. A little more than, all right, in Durham County. Oh, Ellen, my gosh. <laughs> Great champion, Ellen Reckow, whom you've been celebrating today. Where else, other than say Durham and maybe Orange? Chatham. Where Chatham? Chatham. Chatham. Okay. Three out of a hundred. <laughs> Not too good. We can do a lot more, and we've got to. Uh, I think the federal government needs to get far more committed to this. It's not in race to the top. There are there is other funding. Why shouldn't it be a part of the education program, huh? I just talked to the people who did the North Carolina Race to the Top program. Two states got it today. Do you know who they are? Delaware, Delaware and uh, Tennessee. Tennessee, Marguerite. Uh -huh. Folks, we, we've got to put these things together. It's all got to be seen as education. You do it differently in the early years, of course. But we have got to see this as education. We've got to see it as preparing that workforce and making us globally competitive. And finally, the private sector has got to has got to really be behind it and involved in it. Uh, I spoke to our wonderful Marsha, the, uh, the program here in Durham County, the Smart Start program. You ought to see the logos of the businesses that support it. I remember in Caldwell County years ago, every business in the county was a partner of Smart Start. Every single one of them, hundreds. So we've got to have the private sector really helping us out. They can get government to do things. They can get churches to do things, synagogues, all kinds of things. But the private sector has to believe in it. I remember a crucial time when we were selling Smart Start and had to get the money. And we had to have a 10% match. I had a meeting. I used, I used to have a business council. All the big business CEOs met with me four times a year. An evening and the next day, part of the day. I got the five biggest businesses in North Carolina at a table just like this one. And I said, fellas, they were all men. <laughs> they weren't they were as good as they could have been. I said, fellas, I've got to have two million dollars a piece for each of you. I got it. But the big thing wasn't the 10 million. It was Bank of America, now Wells Fargo, IBM, all of those people holding <laughs> up and saying, we believe this is important. We're behind it. You, legislature, you help with it. You, county leaders, you help on it. All kinds of businesses. This is critical. We've got to keep doing that. But we've also got to measure how well we're doing, and we've got to get Americans really committed to doing this together. So much, all three of you, uh, Governor Hunt, Ron, Larry. Uh, very stimulating. Uh,
couple of quick thoughts, and then I do want to open it up for conversation. Um, we've got some time for conversation, and then we'll wrap up shortly and have a, a reception opportunity, which I'll tell you more about. But I was quite intrigued. Ron talked about how we must quit beating around the bush and, and focus, focus on minority children. Uh, Governor Hunt talked about how we've got to link early childhood with ultimate education outcomes. And I have certainly seen that in the work that America's Promise is doing, uh, trying to create this culture of a grad nation. You can't wait till 11th grade to see that a child graduates from high school. It must start in early childhood. Um, Larry talks about the need for developmental equity. So a lot of these themes here are talking about more focus for resources, and isn't that what we have to do when resources are limited? So where is the money best spent and how to then mobilize the support for it? So one question is, how do we mobilize and inspire our elected officials and policymakers to invest in children when times are tough and budgets are in crisis and families are certainly in crisis as well? And so I want to think with us about the strategy for mobilizing for children. And then I want to think about where to focus um, and how to focus our resources. And then, in addition, whatever else was uh, inspired uh, you to think and, and to, to get excited. So let's invite some questions from the audience, um, see where this takes us. Thoughts, comments, questions, please. We have some roving mics. Okay, I just want to make a comment when Ron said about the factor of four, nobody gets that. At age 30, we now know what proportion of our treated and controlled abecedarian kids not just went to college, but have a college degree or higher. You want to bet? It's four times. Wow. Okay, there you go. I might also add, we didn't talk so much about health. But uh, their health and education outcomes are linked as well, which is quite interesting. Uh, I saw a study from Robert Wood Johnson that says premature death could see a 25% improvement if we solve the high school dropout crisis. And there is scarcely nothing of greater impact that medical science could offer. So we do have health outcomes at stake when we don't see good education outcomes. Questions, comments? I'm Sonny Ladd from Duke University. Um, I'm an economist by training. I'm a big fan of measurement and thinking about effectiveness and efficiency, but that's not what I want to push you on. I spent the last spring of last year in the Netherlands um, looking at education policy there. And what struck me was the very different culture and values in that country. There was just a standard notion that we don't want to leave any group behind, and that regardless of what we measure or not, it, it's just really important that all kids have access to health care early on and as they go through the system, and the Dutch have set up lots of community schools and all sorts of things. They don't actually know whether these work, but it comes from this cultural belief that they just don't want to leave people behind. So I guess this is a question for Governor Hunt. How do we change the culture in this country to do what's fair or sort of appropriate for society? Well, I think you've got to, you've got to have some sort of benchmarks. You're helping them to do what? Just because you love them and care for them and they're entitled to it? That's enough for me. It's not enough for the legislature of North Carolina. Sonny, I, you know, I, I admire you greatly, and, and I'd, I'd be more interested in, in what you're thinking about, but, but we've got a lot of people in this country who don't have the kinds of feelings for those children that you saw there. You go, can you get the Tea Partiers to do what you're talking about? <laughs> and a lot of people who aren't that far off, I call it off, but... Uh, <laughs> But you see what I'm saying. I, 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 I want to prove, listen, I want to I show people that this is the smart thing to do for all of us, for our economic growth, for our jobs, for our future. 
And I think, so, yeah, let's, let's do all the things I think, uh, I'd like to learn from that and see, you know, if we can do it better uh, and why that's working there to the extent that it is. But I'm not sure that's going to work here. I want evidence that the investments we're making and the kinds of approaches we're, we're saying we ought to be taking is working so that we'll have every child starting to school healthy and ready to learn. We don't have that by a long shot today. If we have that, then I think we got a shot at getting them all to graduate. And the president's uh, goal of having the, what is it, highest college graduation by 2020. <laughs> but I think we got to measure and we got to really focus on having all of them ready to learn when they start. Um, I agree with everything the government said, of course, and if I didn't, I wouldn't tell you. Um, <laughs> here's one way you will know when, I don't know about culture, but when our political culture is taking this problem seriously that we will have highly qualified school teachers in the inner city. That is the single biggest thing I believe. We've got to do preschool as well. But we've got to have a system in which we have our best teachers, our very highly qualified teachers in the inner city. And the only way to do that that I can think of is to pay them more. And when legislatures commit to that, then we're making progress. And poor rural areas. I can take you some places in this state as poor as any inner city in America. Fewer people. Governor Hunt, I want to pick up on that very point. Uh, Arnie Duncan has uh, picked up on research done by Dr. Bob Balfrance at Johns Hopkins, highlighting that 2,000 high schools account for half the problem among youth of color in terms of dropouts, the lowest performing schools, and they are in every state. There are clusters in urban cities, but they are also uh, clustered in the southeast. So we do know that the lowest performing schools are right here in Durham. Um, Southern High School, which is the featured school for the East Durham Children's Initiative. So uh, one thought on focusing our resources is to take those lowest performing schools and look at the ecosystem that surrounds those anchor high schools. What do the feeder middle schools look like? What do the feeder elementary schools look like? What are the resources those children have or don't have and those families have or don't have? And that is a great place to start. In a time of scarcity, we can focus our resources on those families that feed those lowest performing schools. And that, Ron, is part of your not being afraid to call out, that we've got to start focusing our resources where the need is greatest if we're going to have the macro impact that we all seek in this country. We don't have time for incremental solutions. And I think that's what worries me the most. We don't have time to improve our children's outcomes by 1% a year for the next 10 years. We need macro impact. So we must focus where the need is greatest. Well, I, I certainly agree that we need to focus where the need is greatest. But I think Sonny is also calling our attention to the fact that uh, there's dangers that when you focus on the neediest, uh, you, you potentially limit the political base for support. Uh, and there, there's a, there's a, at least I will uh, put uh, um, that on the table as a, in part a response to, to Sonny's question about um, how do you promote a political and national culture in which all children are, are valued. And, that, and, and uh, so targeting is right scientifically and economically and strategically, but it's got to be targeting within some kind of vision of universalism and of, of a common nation and the communication strategies associated with that because those 2,000 lowest performing schools are, are the last production point in uh, a, a set of uh, communities that have created those. I, I, I don't think we can focus only on those 2,000 lowest performing schools for the reasons that Grad Nation describes. And, and so I'll just mention two other things, which is, um, there is actually remarkable academic work now going on about how public attitudes are developed uh, in different areas. And, uh, and the, the, the cognitive heuristics associated with taking different kinds of political and ideological positions. And uh, our side can't afford to just spend money to figure out the right kind of marketing communication strategies. We actually have to use research because we have to be more efficient at that. And there are no uh, beneficial communication strategies that I think we have to put on the table if we want to actually organize in a way, because we're not a Netherlands. 
Netherlands. We, we, are, we although neither is the Netherlands. Uh, so, 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 uh, so, for instance, Sweden, uh, the, 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 the country, the European country that Americans most like to hate if they don't like commie pinko stuff, um, uh, is one ninth, one ninth uh, immigrants at this point. Uh, so, so um, the world is becoming more diverse, and how to develop common agendas in a diverse world and reduce the structural sources of inequality I, uh, uh, have to be part of this, too. Thank you. Uh, good question here. Governor Hunt, I want to thank you for your response to Dr. Ladd because you made me think about something, and thank you for the fellow panelists as well. Uh, you know, a lot of us here live in Durham. And I want us to look each other in the eye right now and see if we can respond to what Gover Governor Hunt said. Can we ensure that all of our children, birth to five, have adequate health care, have adequate housing, and have nurturing and educational environments? We are the most privileged people in this county. And can we look each other in the eye right now and take the gift of this prompt and the expertise of our panel and say, you know what? We are exactly the county that is going to get it done. <laughs> and and our, our Grad Nation campaign wants to hold up Durham as a model to the rest of the country. I do think you have the, uh, the, the tools and the strategies right here and the, will, the willpower. I just wanted to make a comment which piggybacks uh, both on Larry's and Simon. And I really do think that the surrounding belief systems that, that are existing in our society cultivate um, despondency in response to problems of this kind. And the despondency trickles down. I think that Ron Haskins point about, about not paying our teachers, about teachers themselves being despondent about the outcome, that the attitudinal problems go beyond simply having positive attitudes toward children but actually having a sense uh, that we have in many other regions of our, our, our uh, country, and that is that you can do this. Uh, and I think we've come to the place where we don't believe we can. Uh, I think demonstrating we can is very important, but I also think, given what we know about the social science of attitudes, how they spread, what the nature of contagion is, how one alters a system so those attitudes shift, so individuals become more future, focused rather than present focused and are able to, to not engage in hyperbolic discounting with regard to making choices in the system, I think that's terribly important. And I think the attitudinal dimension of this is has to be part of the policy package. Uh, uh, it needs money. You can throw money at it. It needs programs. They have to be well constructed. But you also need attitude shifting. And how one does that to create a political base for change in Durham or anywhere is really critical. Um, uh, we have time for two more questions. Yes, sir. Um, I know we all will have our unique perspective on how is the best way to deploy resources towards this. But uh, Governor Hunt, I was struck by your suggestion that we should douse children with words to help them have better vocabulary. I study uh, infant cognitive development. And I'm just curious, where in this process do we fit in research that will help us determine what is the best strategy because it also might be focusing on specific words rather than dousing. And I don't mean to, I'm not taking you to task, but where does the research fit in to develop the curriculum to tell the teachers what to do? Actually, I, I was afraid you were making fun of my word douse. <laughs> <laughs> Try to think of the right word. That's not it. But, uh, you figure it out. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. Uh, I agree at, with you. At, at Frank Porter Graham, we have a group that's working right now right. on looking at children, infants, and toddlers, and trying to come up with right. how does developmental science translate into uh -huh. the best, most efficient yeah. practices to accomplish these goals. That's exactly what we ought to do. Okay, well, let's talk about that. And, and then, by the way, by the way, these teachers that we are working hard to make better through the efforts of Smart Start and and all of the things we're doing, we've got to do so much more. Uh, we've got to know what are those words. And we've got to help those parents who may not even know those words learn those words. Right. 
And we've all got to be using them. Everywhere these kids are, even the coaches maybe. Because we've got to do a lot more than our athletes <laughs> in, in any event. Hey, we can do this. You're talking about attitudes? We can do this. This is America. We've got great leaders. A lot of, most of them are great. Uh, but but I, I would challenge you all here at this wonderful center and over at Frank Porter Gray, which I brag on all the time, you all figure out what to do with it. But it's, we've got to get, I, I want every child that starts the school to know those words and to be healthy and ready to learn. All of them. You can't graduate. Well, your chances of graduating are very poor if you don't start that way. We're on it. <laughs> <laughs> very encouraged by their uh, focus on improving quality. But we talked extensively at that meeting about um, in rural communities by nature of our rurality, we have to focus on place-based and relationship-based strategies. And I would offer that researchers and all of us policymakers remember that it, I believe, at least, it's one person at a time that we change our culture and that every individual contact that we make changes our culture, and that we have to persevere and move that forward for our children. Thank so you. So that's a good note to end on, because it is up to each of us to make the change possible for our children. We must be vo the, their voices. So I invite all of you to give our panelists a round of applause.